Hello, everybody. This is Alex Sherlockman with Telrad. Uh, people are joining in. We're going to give it a few minutes to uh, to pack the room, <laughs> if you will, and we're going to get started. Welcome everybody. Alex Freelichman with Telrad. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick note that we're still waiting for people to join in. Uh, maybe another one, two minutes, and we kind of get started. Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, thank you again for joining our uh, first of the series uh, webinar, uh, Siberia series webinars. My name is Alex Relofman. Uh, I'm a director of sales for Telred. Uh, our panelists today, uh, a person joining the webinar and, and doing the second half, the, the heavy lifting part uh, is Michael. He is with Federated Wireless. As you know, Federated Wireless is is a major contrib con contributor into the CBRS success. And uh, I want to make sure that, that uh, Michael will be able to uh, present the value, reasoning, and talk a little bit about the technology behind uh, Federated Wireless. Uh, we're going to have a couple polls in the process. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise hands um, and type questions in the chat. And uh, I should be able to, uh, to address them as we go with presentation. So I'll take maybe about 10 minutes to talk a little bit, give a quick refresher about Telred. Uh, and the rest of the time, Probably about 20, 30 minutes uh, will be mics. And uh, after all, we're going to leave a uh, little bit of time for Q&A. On that note, we can get started. So uh, just a quick refresher who Telrad is. Uh, we are a 67-year-old company. We have been an Israel, uh, we've been established in, uh, with an Israeli-based company established in 1951. Pretty much the first technology firm in the state of Israel since its inception. 
Uh, in North America, we do have uh, in excess of 300 uh, networks, uh, some of that legacy, some of that YMAX, and many of them are LTE. Globally, uh, there are over 4 million CPs deployed uh, in over 150 countries. So uh, that yeah, kind of gives an idea that we've been around for some time. Uh, and uh, do carry quite a big, uh, quite a series of, of portfolio of intellectual property and know-how of building fixed wireless networks. So uh, every product that we uh, offer today are built around the same concept: is uh, some, is technology that you uh, that that uh, this is forward-looking technology, it stays on the tower longer. Uh, gives you better bang for a buck, if you will, um, and uh, uh, allows you to 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 uh, to build better quality networks. Uh, some of our customers, uh, bigger customers in North America, uh, some of the names that may be familiar to you, maybe not. Um, uh, but uh, these are our success stories. Every single one of you that our existing customer today is our success story, but some of the success stories are a little bit bigger in size, and we do value and appreciate everybody's business. Um, application, where we fit. Uh, as you know, our technology is an LTE-based technology, so very often people start thinking, oh, well, it's coming from mobile world. How well is it going to work for fixed? And uh, this is where we come in very strong with, with uh, a good value proposition where we say, yes, uh, because we're, com we, we're coming from fixed wireless broadband space, uh, the, the know-how of building fixed wireless networks is second to none. Uh, with that, exactly the same know-how of building you know, legacy networks, WiMAX, was brought into the LTE, and some of the software features, some of the technology incorporated into the into the existing LTE portfolio, um, uh, provides us ability to um, uh, to build really cool LTE networks. Now, applications can be anything. It can be anything from residential to municipality delivering bandwidth to rural areas, as many, will, uh, many of you use. Uh, and the big question is, do we support mobility? No, we do not. Uh, even though LTE comes from a mobile world, we do not support mobility. It's, I like to call it nobodicity, but uh, it, it's not mobility. So that's a, a big differentiating element uh, between us and other players that uh, provided technology for mobile carriers. A uh, little bit about our uh, portfolio. So our LT portfolio consists of four main components. It starts obviously with uh, something that goes in the tower, but it's a little bit more than that. It starts with an EPC, Evolve Packet Core. In our case, EPC comes in two flavors. It can be embedded into the base station, and we call it LTE in the box, or it can be an external appliance. Uh, obviously, we offer a variety of base stations, and the most popular one available in CBRS frequency band. We have a variety uh, of CPEs, anything from category four to category 12. Uh, and the most important piece of, this, of, the, of the puzzle that makes things, it, it ties things together and makes it work uh, and the reason why we're able to transition into the CBRS without a forklift is uh, BreezeView, uh, our network management platform. Uh, it be, with transition to CBRS, BreezeView becomes our domain proxy server, and it allows us to uh, to to uh, software migrate all of our CBRS, all of our Compact 1000 networks into CBRS. So for every existing customer of ours that purchased the group in the past four or five years, um, for them, as long as it's an LTE system, uh, it's, um, you know, for them, it's a software path into um, CBRS. Um, some of the unique 
capability of our gear, uh, the base station can be deployed six different ways. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit unusual. You usually buy a product that kind of fits the application, then you buy another product that fits another application. In our case, um, it, with different variations of licenses, you can you can have a base station that will fit low density market, and you can have the same exact same base station that can fit high density markets or high capacity markets, depending what you're trying to achieve. And that's the beauty part of Telrad. Uh, essentially, you're going to be keeping one SKU on the shelf as a spare if you need one. Um, it's a little bit different, it's unusual, but it works really well with our distributors and our customers. A uh, little bit about our portfolio. Uh, so the most popular base station, as I mentioned, is called Compact 1000. Uh, it's available in 3.5 gigahertz. We've been shipping exactly the same product since 2015, basically. Um, uh, initially, it's been uh, available for upper 50 megahertz, part 90. Uh, however, radio can cover almost 300 megahertz of spectrum. So with CBRS, it went, we, we took it back through the FCC certification and got type approval, uh, uh, type, uh, part 96 type approval. Uh, got ongo certification. So now this base station is fully CBRS certified and can be used on CBRS networks. So now with exactly same base station, legally you can operate in full 150 megahertz from 355 to 370 uh, as long as uh, uh, as long as you're operating uh, under the CBRS umbrella. Uh, we have recently made an announcement about our five gigahertz. Um, uh, it's it's a new product. It's exactly the same LTE technology, uh, except we did see a need for an unlicensed, uh, unlicensed uh, LTE. Um, so we have just recently introduced that. Uh, base stations are already shipping, CPs are on the way, so there is a little bit of shortage of that. But uh, for customers that are looking to stay within the same LTE platform today, uh, and tomorrow, looking to possibly do inner band carrier aggregation, our five gigahertz platform will be will will deliver very interesting and new capabilities. Again, that will allow for equipment to stay on the tower longer. Um, so a little bit of our, uh, as far as CPE portfolio, we do offer a variety of CPEs. Uh, our most common ones, uh, the 8100 series and 9000 series, uh, either uh, category four or category six devices. Um, we recently introduced category 12 CPE. Uh, the uh, category 12 device, kept, uh, the CPE 12000, uh, provides additional capabilities, uh, such as four by four, as well as two feet six clump. Um, uh, all of the CPs can work on the same sector at the same time, and that's the beauty part of LTE. It allow, gives, provides you a very strong backwards and forwards compatibility. So one of the features uh, that uh, we will be uh, we're, we're preparing and we'll be making uh, some additional announcements a little bit later in the year. Uh, early into the next year is base, sta base station chaining. Um, uh, again, uh, we're always going for, the, it, it, CBRS is great, but the question is, can we maximize use of CBRS? And, and there is only so much you can do with five and a half bits per hertz. Can we maximize the spectral efficiency? Uh, and the answer is yes. You can combine two base stations and Take advantage of both and carrier aggregation and the MU MIMO, thus providing, you know, uh, 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 taking advantage of bigger chunks, accommodate more customers. Uh, and uh, in case if you're combining one CBRS base station and one 5 gigahertz base station, you'll be able to take advantage of inner band carrier aggregation. And if you have, a du which later in, in the year will be introduced as well, a dual band CPE, 5 gig and 3 gig. Um, you'll be able to grab 20 megahertz channel from CBRS frequency band or 10 megahertz, whatever the channel width is, uh, another channel from five gigahertz, 
and thus be able to deliver customers bigger uh, packages um, uh, you know, up to 200 megabits essentially. Total capacity up to 200 megs, so packages of 100 by 20 will be very, very doable. Now, uh, and that's a little bit more about the dual band CP. Uh, and on that note, uh, I am done with our piece and would like to pass uh, to pass uh, presenter mode to Michael and he will be able to, um, uh, to, to talk about a lot more interesting stuff than, than our hardware. Right, I am loaded with interesting facts. <laughs> Hold on, Michael. I'm, I'm I'm trying to figure out how you how you switch this to your. Yeah, all my time at the Citrix, I might not even be able to tell you this at this point. There you go. You should be able to go next to my name, make me presenter. There we go. Yep. Yep. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. I will assume that that's a yes. All right, very good. All right, my name is Michael Ahrens. I am a uh, federated wireless field operations engineer. And, and basically what that means is uh, I do my best to work with customers and um, equipment manufacturers such as Telrad to make the, uh, to help embrace CBRS and make that uh, embrace go as smoothly as possible. So I've put together some material here to provide a whirlwind tour through CBRS. And I'm gonna get started right away with this information. Right off the bat, this is what everybody wants to know. Where, where are we in the evolution of CBRS? And and what does this ICD thing mean anyway? So right now, we are in what I would call the first third of ICD, or Initial Commercial Deployment. On September 16th, the FCC here in the United States gave, uh, gave SAS administrators the, uh, the thumbs up to go forward with initial field trials of their technology. And that period is called ICD, or Initial Commercial Deployment. And up to this point, all of our uh, customers and partners, they have been doing whatever testing of CBRS they've done using STAs. Now, no longer, we've been running our, our SAS in full Part 96 compliance mode since September 18th, just a couple of days after the FCC gave the public notice that ICD had begun. We understand that ICD may last in total between 30, I'm sorry, between 60 and 90 days, the first 30 days of which is a, a compliance period. And, um, all SAS administrators have to give uh, some reporting to the FCC after those first 30 days. Then they need to take some time to review those results, and that could be an additional 30 to 60 days. So with all said and done, sometime in the November, December timeframe is when we expect to go full commercial. And um, 150 megahertz should be available everywhere except for uh, places where uh, Spectrum is protected. We all we all know that uh, the purpose of the SAS is to protect incumbents, and if we don't know that, we will certainly do so by the end of this half hour. Uh, another thing that is on people's minds as well is PAL. Um, when do I when do I get the CBRS spectrum that I can actually treat as licensed? And in, it was just recently announced that in June of 2020, the FCC is going to hold Auction 105, and that will be auctioning off the first uh, priority access licenses up to uh, uh, 70, 70 megahertz, 7, 10 megahertz channels in every county of the United States. Uh, that would be licensable for a 10-year term, uh, conditional, Renewal and the ability to to resell 
uh, basically create a secondary market for that spectrum. So that's where we are in CBRS. So that's, that's the first thing that most people ask me. So now that that's done, we can actually get to uh, some of the other content in the presentation. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to do a short bit about who Federated Wireless is. We'll talk a bit about why CBRS is compelling to customers and equipment manufacturers such as Telrad. Then we'll talk about the technology itself at a very high level, about what makes it tick. Then we'll talk about uh, CPI training and then a little bit about GAA coexistence. And then we'll break. So we're going to touch on these things pretty quickly. Uh, I have a fair number of slides. I will hit them generally conceptually, not necessarily point by point, just to keep the pace uh, on time. So first, about Federated Wireless. Federated Wireless is one of the uh, pioneers in shared spectrum technology. We are the leading neutral enabler of shared spectrum of the shared spectrum ecosystem. And what that means is we have no designs on becoming a service provider. We have no designs on becoming an equipment manufacturer. Our role in the industry is to make others successful, right? Help people capitalize on CBRS. We have offices in Arlington, Virginia in the U.S., which is where I'm sitting right now. In addition, we have offices in Boston and in Silicon Valley. We're founding members of the WIND Forum and the CBRS Alliance, the uh, two, two uh, primary standards bodies, two standards bodies really in, in CBRS technology. And we are working to accelerate a very promising private LTE and 5G markets. In addition, we've recently announced another round of funding, bringing our total of, uh, of uh, funds invested, private funds invested to date to 126 million. And these are some of our, our investors, including some new ones. So it's an exciting time to be in CBRS. What do we make? We make the spectrum controller. And the spectrum controller consists of a Spectrum Access System, or a SAS. Everyone has heard that term, I would imagine. Um, <clears throat> and that is a cloud-based system, fully telco-grade, cloud-deployed cloud system, um, and cloud-scale system that manages the allocation of spectrum. We also have built from the ground up with the collaboration and cooperation of the Department of Defense our own environmental sensing network. And we have deployed somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 sensors around uh, the coast of the United States, and their job is to help protect federal incumbents in the water. And just to reiterate, the job of the SAS right now is to protect incumbents. And I'll hit that point a couple of more times over the, over the course of this half hour. We also have a spectrum planning tool, map that shows where, uh, where there are some protection areas, where there are some quiet zones, where CBRS or really any other type of radio can't be used. Um, so that should help in, the, uh, in planning where to deploy CBRS equipment. And it provides a view of how things are now and how things will look when um, Part 90 licenses start to expire in April 2020 if, if, nothing, uh, if nothing changes. And we also, have an online training uh, uh, program for uh, CPIs, or Certified Professional Installers. So we'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. So why CBRS? What's CBRS making possible? Uh, essentially, the CBRS is, is sort of the first foray into sharing spectrum for commercial use, and we're sharing it with federal incumbents, and therefore, um, since we're sharing it, uh, some of it's being offered for, for free, right? So that, that's a good price. It's certainly less expensive than uh, what folks are paying for Spectrum nowadays. Uh, once priority access licensing uh, becomes available, then there will be some payment for Spectrum, but for the, uh, for the GAA, 
spectrum, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that's all free. And that's enabling in-building deployments, private LTE, any place where Wi-Fi might be being used today but isn't necessarily cutting the mustard from a congestion standpoint or interference standpoint. There are many applications that just don't tolerate that well. Um, so private LTE uh, is, a, uh, is a compelling solution there. We're also working with cable operators, uh, saving them some money with MVNO offload and uh, helping them to create uh, create compelling offerings for private LTE, perhaps in the residence. MNOs, mobile operators, are looking at this technology for densifying their networks, adding additional capacity, uh, doing carrier ag, and it's going. And CBRS is going to be an enabler for 5G. And of course, uh, to to tell to address Telrad's primary market here. Um, uh, wireless broadband is, is also a key use case in CBRS, right? Uh, help, and it certainly is a, a good investment for, uh, for the United States as well um, to basically bring more folks who are hard to reach onto, uh, onto, the, onto the Internet and provide them with uh, access to all of the great stuff that's out there. Neutral host is also a use case in airports and Campuses, apartments, arenas, any place where you've got a lot of a lot of folks around that may want to use their own carrier. This is a uh, this is a solution for that as well. So just again another uh, slide, just talking about the various different private LTE applications. We see use cases in utilities and retail and in airports, smart offices, hotels, um, really any place you could use LTE today. Um, there's a place for it with CBRS. And uh, to just reinforce our partnership with Telrad here, uh, this uh, one of the first forays into, uh, into CBRS with Telrad, uh, we're looking at a fixed wireless use case for residential and business uh, in the central United States. All right, so with the use cases addressed, let's talk a little bit about how spectrum sharing works. How does the technology work? And what we have here is a, um, is a, is a depiction of the SAS. <clears throat> it's in the center, the spectrum access system, which we, which we talked about before. This is one of the things that Federated Wireless brings to bear to support the CBRS ecosystem. On the right, we have various users of Spectrum, some of, the, some of which we just talked about in the various use cases, in arenas and in hotels, enterprises, retail, healthcare. And on the left, we have our sensor network, which we deployed around the coastal United States that helps to protect against naval incumbents on the water. What the way CBRS is actually used is one of these entities here on the right, one of these customers, attempts to get some spectrum. They register with the SAS and say, SAS, give me some spectrum. And the SAS looks at where the device is and the surrounding area and says, you know what, I can give you the spectrum you asked for. And it does that. It grants the spectrum and then allows the device to transmit. While the device is transmitting, it's on the air, it's, it's doing its thing. At some point, a naval incumbent may approach the coastal United States where this radio is deployed, say it's on the coast. The sensor network will detect that activity and we will protect it by telling the radio that you, uh, you know, your right to use the spectrum is, is suspended. And then at that point, the, uh, the device would make, uh, would make uh, use of other channels in order to stay on the air. So basically what we're doing is we're allocating spectrum and providing it to customers for their, for their commercial use and protecting incumbents, whether they're on the water or whether they're on land. And there are some land-based incumbents that we protect against or we protect from CBRS. 
um, <clears throat> and allow all to share the spectrum. And what is the spectrum? Spectrum is its LTE band 48. It runs between 3.55 uh, giga, 3.55 gigahertz and 3.7 gigahertz. There are three primary classes of, of users, starting at the top with the incumbents. They are protected from all users. So first is the naval radar that we discussed. There are satellite services that offer in, that operate in this band as well. Uh, they operate between 3,600 and, and north of 3,700 in some cases. Then there's the Part 90 uh, grandfathered wireless providers that typically operate between uh, 3,650 or 3.65 and 3.7. Then um, priority access licenses will be the, the spectrum that uh, entities can purchase at auction starting in June, and they will be protected from GAA users, which are at the uh, at the bottom of the at the bottom of this hierarchy. Um, TAL users, as they're called colloquially, uh, will be granted up to uh, they, they will be able to get um, in any one county up to 70 megahertz in any one county. And any one particular entity can own up to 40 uh, megahertz in, <clears throat> in that locale. And then at the bottom of the hierarchy are the general authorized access. So this is free access to the spectrum. They can use any spectrum not in use. So basically, if there, if there are no PAL users and no incumbents in a particular geography, then the whole 150 megahertz is available for use. Anyway, that's, that's an overview of how the CBRS spectrum is shared. CBRS devices are referred to as CBSDs, um, and there are a couple of different categories that are defined by uh, the Wind Forum. There's a category A device and a category B device, and they each have separate requirements. Category A's can be either indoor or outdoor. They can operate up to uh, 30 dBm per megahertz. That's the maximum EIRP they're allowed to register with the SAS with. And then there are category B CBSDs, and they can only be used outdoors and they can go up to 47 dBm per 10 megahertz. And they require the use of a certified professional, or they require a certified professional installer to, to sign the parameters that are used to configure them. And in reality, we'll see in a, in a little bit that really CPIs are, are gonna be necessary for just about any radio. And then for those applications that require end-user devices like handsets and, and little MiFi hotspots, uh, our end-user devices that operate below 23 dBm, they don't have to talk to the SAS at all, but they do have to communicate with a CBSD that does talk to the SAS. So just on this slide, you'll see some of the uh, some of the other. Uh, criteria for what makes a category A and a category B radio. <clears throat> As we talked about before, the purpose of the SAS is to protect incumbents. That's, that is job one. And our, uh, our key incumbents are uh, the Department of Defense, in particular the Navy. Uh, they operate uh, a number of aircraft carriers, up to 19 of them. Uh, and they could be uh, along the coastal United States at any point. And if they are in those waters and using their radar, we can't interfere with them. And the SAS uh, is, is, uh, is designed to ensure that, we, that no CBSD does interfere with them. In addition, inland, there are satellite operators. We talked about those, wireless uh, internet service providers, Part 90 providers radar sites, uh, FCC offices, things like that that have requirements to protect them from interference from CBRS devices. 
just to talk a little bit more about what's the, what happens on the coast, as we talked about a few slides ago, Federated Wireless deployed a sensing network, an environmental sensing network, all down the coast of the United States, uh, all around, I should say. These offshore regions and coastal regions are defined or divided into dynamic protection areas, DPAs. These are defined uh, by the government. We monitor these DPAs with our sensing network. Um, <clears throat> and when we detect activity from an incumbent, if a ship sails into, those, into any one of those squares that you could see along the coast, we pick it up and we let the SAS know that there is a ship there. And uh, we, we direct CBSDs to, to stop transmitting on, on any channels that might interfere with the operation of those ships. And the protection areas extend inland, sometimes up to 500 kilometers inland, really depending on the, the contour of the coast. So um, our spectrum planning tool actually shows you how those protection areas map out along the coast. And I've mentioned protection a few times because job one of the SAS, as I said, is to protect incumbents. Uh, one other more extreme form of, of protection is exclusion. And exclusion is basically the complete unavailability of spectrum or, or, or piece of spectrum or even the whole 150 megahertz in some cases um, <clears throat> under some conditions. So uh, in uh, there's the NRAO, that, net, that national quiet zone out on the border of Virginia and West Virginia, it's a big rectangle out there that has a lot of sensitive equipment that's used for, uh, for, uh, for astronomy and weather purposes and nobody can transmit there. And we, we force, we, we protect those as well. Uh, in addition, in, in cases where grandfathered wireless providers are within 40 kilometers of a satellite, we protect the upper 50 megahertz from 36, uh, 3650 to 3700 megahertz. Uh, we basically make that unavailable um, for anyone. In, in, for 150 uh, kilometers around that satellite. So that's uh, what we mean by exclusion. And just to reiterate, in April of 2020, when the licenses for Part 90 providers start to expire, we'll see fewer of those exclusion zones and they'll just become protection zones. And protection zones, in a lot of cases, they, they just mean that you can operate, but your, your power might be limited. Right, so that's exclusion and protection, two, two mechanisms that are in place that help keep, uh, keep incumbents free of interference from CBRS devices. And this map actually uh, is, a, is a, a screenshot from our spectrum planning tool that I mentioned before, and here you can see where along the coast, the red lines uh, extending in for uh, protecting <clears throat> incumbents from transmission by category B radios. Uh, the black dotted lines around the coast and around some of the uh, inland areas are the uh, category A uh, boundaries. And the big circles, those are exclusion areas where there are uh, grandfathered wirelesses in, in proximity to a satellite. And there, therefore, the, the upper 50 is excluded. Right? So this map shows how, how this all lays out geographically. And you can see all the little blue dots. And if you zoom in on, on the spectrum tool, which you can, you can zoom in really close, you can see that those are all polygons for Part 90 providers. And after April 2020, when those licenses start to expire, uh, those, those, er those areas will start to disappear and you'll wind up with a more uniform, um, darker blue uh, darker blue, blue covering of the country distribution of spectrum without all these holes in it. Um, and the spectrum tool gives you a good picture of, of that. And the different colors on the spectrum tool 
uh, mapped to the amount of spectrum available in that geography. And then finally, about the technology, the, the way that this all works, the way that the SAS, the SAS is able to control the behavior of the radios is through a WinForm defined protocol. It's a simple request response protocol. Not that many messages. It's pretty straightforward. Um, allows the CBSD to, to talk to our SAS, to register to it, to request a grant of spectrum, and then once they've got it, to keep alive on it. So that's really all I'll go into on the uh, SAS to C CBSD protocol. But it's a uh, it's a a communication protocol that operates between the CBSD and where our SAS is in the cloud. So those are the those are the nuts and bolts of CBRS and what it's supposed to do and a little bit about how it works. Of course, that's just scratching the surface. Changing gears, want to talk about our certified professional installer program. CBSDs require a CPI to sign, to digitally sign, the installation parameters for <clears throat> for any, uh, according to the rules, for any category B radio, any outdoor radio, or any category A radio with kind of radio. And um, also for an indoor category A where the device can't really self-locate through GPS. The CPI has got to digitally sign the installation parameters such as the maximum EIRP, the azimuth, the uh, antenna gain, the height. All of those parameters that control the operation of the radio need to be digitally signed by a CPI, uh, basically attesting to the fact that indeed this certified installer uh, set this radio up properly. Practically, though, the reality is that pretty much any CBSD needs to have a CPI sign the, param the, the parameters since, uh, regardless of the category of the radio, since many radios just can't self-locate. So once you can't self-locate, you need to have a CPI sign the parameters. So how does one become a CPI? You don't have to climb poles to do it. You just have to understand how radios work. And the process to do it is you could uh, come to Federated Wireless and uh, sign up for our CPI training program. And what it is, it's a, uh, a, an online course that lasts about uh, five to six hours to go through all the materials. And these are, uh, these are the different modules. And uh, module one, the introduction to CBRS, goes into much greater detail on CBRS than I went through here, um, as well as all of the other modules. Uh, we are a WinForum accredited program. We have a, a test that's uh, populated with WinForum design questions. And we can uh, notify the test taker immediately upon uh, uh, completion of the test, whether they passed or they need to take it again. And um, then after they pass the test, they get a digital certificate from from our CA provider, which is in this case Insta for us. And then uh, once they get the digital certificate, then the CPI can go and sign parameters uh, for any CBSD for any organization they uh, are representing. So that's a bit about our CPI training program. And finally, uh, one word on coexistence, right? The word, the term coexistence can mean many, many things to many, many people, um, but I just want to define what it is in the context of federated wireless and CBRS, <clears throat> right? And when we talk about coexistence, we mean GAA coexistence, users using the GAA spectrum. So it's best illustrated with an example. So I'm, I'm showing here a picture of, of downtown Chicago. And each of the large rectangles represents an outdoor provider, somebody with a, a lot of category B base stations covering a geography. And in addition, the circles that are surrounded in gold 
are indoor deployments. They could be uh, or, or low power deployments. They could be outdoor hotspots or private LTE or uh, consumer cables, so running, uh, you know, running LTE off the cable box or private LTE or IoT applications in some factory. They are, um, you know, they may have many radios that typically not at very high power. So the way coexistence works, and I'll just talk about coexistence in the in the sense of federated wireless really controlling the whole 150 megahertz in a in a uh, in a geography, right? So just to uh, just to make the point. The way it works is where there is interference between all of these different users, we can break the spectrum up into five chunks of 30 megahertz. So, so basically, if you look in the middle here where I'm tracing with my cursor, and you can see the, the number two, let me see if I could bring up the, uh, the, the laser pointer here, right? So if you, if you look in this area here, Right here, you've got everybody interfering with everybody else. So in this spot right here, you're going to have every different um, provider, every different uh, one of these colors here is going to have 30 megahertz to play with. However, if you, um, if you come out here, right, and you come out here, these two different devices they have the entire 150 megahertz available to them. They're, inter they don't, they're not interfering with each other. They're not interfering with anybody else. In this location, you have a, a only, right over here, this number three, this outdoor hotspot might be interfering with the blue provider here. So they would share the spectrum 75 megahertz and 75 megahertz. So, it, the, the way it works out, that we, we orthogonalize the spectrum, we basically break it into discrete chunks um, according to a method related to the number of potentially interfering parties in a given geography. So coexistence becomes a, uh, uh, becomes a concern in areas where there's going to be a lot of different deployments. And coexistence, the features surrounding them will evolve, right? So coming out of the gate, the way coexistence looks today may, it, you know, it will evolve and become more sophisticated as more entrants start deploying CBRS around the country. Anyway, uh, with that all said, I'm going to turn uh, turn control back to uh, <clears throat> to um, to Alex and. Uh, we can move on with the next section of the talk. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we do have quite a few questions, and uh, I would like to kind of quickly, uh, quickly uh, read some of them, and some of them are for you, and some of them I can answer. Um, so a question from Brian. Uh, how will the SAS handle operating the CPE devices as class B, CBSD? How will SAS coordinate the frequency adjustments? between the NODs and CPE class Bs, um, and if it's required. So, the, so if I understand the question, it's how, how are the categories defined? Is that basically the question? How will the SAS handle operating CPE devices as class B CBSDs? Um, how how will it handle them? Um, um, so when when the when the CBSD registers, right? It registers with um, with information about itself. It reports its uh, location. It reports uh, which way it's pointing. It reports its maximum EIRP per 10 megahertz, right? And uh, it, it can it can do that. It doesn't have to, but in case it doesn't, um, we also have a, uh, the access to the um, to the authorization database from the FCC, and um, <clears throat> we will check um, because every every 
device using uh, CBRS has to be certified by the FCC. So we will check uh, what power range that device is, is in, right? So if it's north of 30 dBm per 10 megahertz, you know, it's a category B. Um, <clears throat> so, so basically that, that's how we, we handle them. Um, and in order to properly register a CBSD with, uh, that, that is a category B, uh, we will enforce the use of signed parameters. If there are no signed parameters coming in on the registration, we won't register it. So um, category A's, they, they have different power limitations, but really there's, there's nothing that says on the category A or category B radio when you, when you take it out of the box. The radio operates at a certain power level and based on what that device has been certified to run, that's, that's what, what uh, dictates its treatment. Does, does that answer the question? Mm, good question. I don't know. Brian, uh, so yeah. just in case, if we did not answer your question fully, yeah, send, send uh, a note please, uh, yeah, send a note offline and we will, uh, we will, we will uh, address that. Uh, question from Nicole. Can you discuss what would happen to SAS and spectrum availability if a C grants uh, petition uh, for the transition of part 90 to part 96 devices? Um, Alex, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. I, it, it's a little hard to hear you. Can you discuss, um, well, it's more a regulatory uh, question, I think. Can you discuss what would happen to the SAS and spectrum availability if FCC grants uh, a petition for the transition of part 90 to part 96 devices. Okay, so this is all speculation on my part, but um, the, uh, the way I would see it operating is how it's operating now, with, because we are protecting part 90 uh, today. So if uh, 90 devices today, so, um, you know, if there is an extension, I would expect that uh, the landscape for spectrum would be as it, as uh, as it is right now. But that's speculation on my part. Okay. Uh, question from Bob: After SAS provides one of the GA channels, how do you lose it? Uh, well, so that's a good question. Um, the the way you lose it there there are a few ways first is um if you relinquish it that's number one so one of those protocol messages that wasn't on the slide was actually a grant relinquishment so you can actually give up the spectrum uh you could uh, um not transmit a, a heartbeat for seven days Right, grants expire automatically after seven days. So, so basically, if you have a grant for seven days and you don't renew it, which, um, which, and, and renewal can be done via the commu communications protocol I illustrated. If you don't renew it, the grant will expire after seven days. Um, so, you know, most folks, I think, will get a grant. And once once they get a grant, they heartbeat on it. And um, <clears throat> at some point, the CBSD will say, hey, you know what? I'm getting close to my seven-day expiration of this grant. I'm going to send a renewal and uh, and then renew the grant. And, and that's, that's how you keep it. And by not doing that is how you lose it. Um, another way of, I guess, I'll... I'll go into this question or answer a little further and say, um, you know, you may not lose it, but you might be suspended for a while from using it in case an incumbent makes an appearance. So uh, if an, an incumbent appears and, say, and, and could potentially be interfered with by uh, a device, it, the SAS will direct it to uh, get off that channel. And at that point, the CBSD can go look for another channel. Uh, to but that would on be applicable only in coastal areas, basically. Um, it, 
Not really, because in some in some cases uh, there are like military installations in the middle of the country that have that act that basically look like a navy ship coming in. But what they do is they schedule they schedule their in, their unavailability, right? So when when they when that when a site like that comes on air and starts doing its thing, at that point we you know we we notify devices that are in, in proximity. So it's the same basic rules that apply. If, if, if the device is transmitting, we can't interfere with it. So it's along the coast or within proximity of an inland DPA. But that doesn't make you lose the spectrum. It just suspends you from using it while the incumbent is using it. And then when the incumbent is done, you get the spectrum back. But, uh, you know, taking the incumbent out of the equation, and just looking at spectrum management in general, it's, it's, uh, it, it's the grant, a grant on spectrum is good for seven days and you can renew it once you have it. So the follow up to the same question, what happens if a CBSD class B comes online, requests the grant and no spectrum is available? What happens? Um, no spectrum is available. Well, then the, uh, the well the device will be registered. That's for sure. But it would, you know, if there's no spectrum available, um, its request for a grant will be um, either rejected or it will um, or it will you know stay suspended for overnight to see you know maybe a better power calculation could be used to get spectrum. I mean, it's quite honestly a, a scenario that that I have not really seen yet. Okay. Uh, how long grandfather uh, provides protect, uh, providers protected for? So currently, the answer uh, is until April 2020. This is the sunset for the current Part 90 rules. Uh, answer from Joshua. Uh, uh, yes. So everybody that uh, so uh, install CP has to be certified. Yes. Everybody that's installing high power device over 30 dBm CBRS device has to be a CPI installer. Um, the CBRS and starts working with Canada. Uh, at the moment, uh, Curtis, uh, at the moment, CBRS is only applicable to North, uh, to United States. Uh, to, 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 to how will SAS deal with binary deployments that no longer uh, those gonna have to be our existing, for example, WiMAX de uh, uh, WiMAX deployments that are running on Compact, they're gonna have to be migrated to LTE. CBRS is only our software is only supporting CBRS for LTE. Um, Question from Stace. Uh, has the pricing model for SaaS services been announced by Federated? Uh, Stacey, let's take this question offline. The, the answer is yes. Um, uh, if you don't mind reaching out offline, we will talk. Uh, we'll, we can talk about the pricing. Uh, uh, Alan, to answer your question, which UEs uh, are currently uh, certified, CBRS certified. So as, as of today, we have uh, two of our UEs, 8,100 and 9,000, waiting for FCC certification, uh, which should happen any day now. So again, all devices with the first wave, all of the 8,100 and 9,000 will be CBRS certified. Uh, with the second wave, uh, we will have uh, the rest of the uh, the rest of the portfolio: seven thousand, eight thousand, and uh, twelve thousand coming in. Uh, uh, the, exp uh, the expiration date for Part 90 sunset is April 2020. I don't remember exact date. I think it's like April 20th or 22nd of 2020. It's basically next year, six months from now. Um, uh, will CP 8,000, 7,000? Uh, yes, so CP 7,000, 8,000 uh, will be compatible. Uh, we uh, are planning to get part 96 certification 
for for the 7,000, 8,000, and 12,000 uh, within the next two to three months. Uh, Edgar, uh, your GM at, at, uh, example uses 30 megahertz for each entity. Is 30 megahertz limit per county or base station or something else? Uh, Mike, this question for you. Why 30 megahertz? Why 30 megahertz in what context? In in your example, uh, you were you, you you had 30 megahertz chunks divided up. Ah, okay. Multiple yeah. Numbers. So yeah. So in I'm going to bring that slide up again real quick just to make sure um, it's clear. Okay. Um, can folks see it? Yes. Okay. So only in this area right here, you can see that um, everybody is interfering with each other. So you've got the black provider, the magenta provider, the red provider, the blue provider, and the gold provider, all in this one area. They're all interfering with each other right here. So there's 150 megahertz to, uh, to, to split up, and you got five ways of doing it, so 30 megahertz per in this geography, right? If you go, if you go here, right, there's only interference between two providers. You've got this, uh, this indoor and you've got this outdoor. So it's 150 megahertz divided by two. So that, that's, that's the general approach to, to splitting up spectrum. So basically the general rule, if I understand correctly, the logic is just equally divided between number of parties. Equally divided between the number of parties who could interfere with each other. That's, so you could have lots of parties in, in one area, like all of these, you know, take away all the squares, just keep all of these gold things around, right? You know, they're all in, in downtown Chicago. So you've got a lot of, you've got three different types of them, but they're all indoors. So they're not interfering with each other. If you take away all of these different colored squares and throw them out of the picture, um, each of them could have, could theoretically have the entire 150 megahertz because they won't interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Edgar, hope we were able to answer your question. Uh, if not, we could take it offline. Uh, interesting question from Rick. Uh, after the grandfather time period, uh, will a CBSD transmitting at 30 dBm near an air base be able to transmit at 47 with an aid of SAS? Is that question, is that question for me? Yes. Okay. Well, will the device be able to transmit at 47? I mean, if there's a, if the device is capable of, of delivering 47 and it's near a, near an air base, um, and the conditions allow it, then you know why not? But otherwise, the SAS is going to control the the power, so it might not get 47. It, you know, it just depends on the the terrain, the height, which way the radio is pointing. Is it pointing towards the air base or away from it? So it's it's hard to it's hard to just answer that question a priori like that. Okay. Uh, who is considered protected? Uh, question from Nick. Who is considered protected? Uh, are WISPs with current CBRS licenses considered protected? Uh, I think it's going back into one of your earlier slides between ex exclusion and protection zone. Okay, um, so is who with the CBRS license being protected? Who is considered protected? Are WISPs oh, with current CBRS? Yeah. Okay, who is protected? So federal incumbents are protected, right? That's the that's the uh, the, the current or the main current focus of protection is the federal government. So that includes the Navy ships. It includes um, satellite services. It includes um, inland DPAs that we talked about, or basically inland areas that that uh, that may go on on the air at some 
you know, for some period of time during the month. Uh, <clears throat> and it, grandfathered wireless providers are also protected. In addition, there's protection for, um, and, and slightly different protection rules for quiet zones or, or uh, geographies around, around FCC offices or other scientific locations um, that are outlined in, in uh, you know, basically in Part 96. But, but in general, think of it, you know, the Navy and satellite providers and grandfathered wireless providers. And then once PAL, once PAL users start uh, using the SAS, then we'll protect uh, PAL users from GAA as well. Okay, one more follow-up question. Uh, also, what happens when SAS is unreachable? Uh, what happens if heartbeat between domain proxy and SAS is down? Okay, well, so first of all, um, the likelihood of that happening um, from a SAS perspective is, is very, very low because of the way that the SAS is designed. It's of geographic redundancy. Um, it's all built into the system, right? So the, the SAS is not is designed to not be unavailable. Um, so if if somebody cuts, you know, all the wires between uh, between a domain proxy and a CBSD, I'm sorry, a domain proxy in the SAS, then heartbeats aren't going to flow between uh, assuming that there was granted spectrum and, and the device had it, um, and the, the the domain proxy can no longer in, uh, communicate with the SAS. Um, <clears throat> in which case, if the if heartbeats wouldn't reach the SAS, so then basically the device, or the the spectrum would go in back, fall back into granted state. It would re it, so basically the grant would not be lost. Um, provided the circuit was fixed, you know, the, whatever damage to the circuit would be repaired um, before the grant expires in seven days, right? If the if the that's repaired and the, the device comes back up and can heartbeat again, then it'll just continue on its merry way. Uh, if, if so, if there is no heartbeat within 60 seconds, uh, does the radio has to go offline or it's still transmitting? If there is no heartbeat, um, it, the heartbeat interval is longer than 60 seconds, right? It's uh, right now we use a heartbeat interval of 200 seconds. That's what we recommend uh -huh. uh, recommend using. So if if there's no heartbeat in that period of time, um, <clears throat> actually, and we add a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of extra to that, there's no heartbeat within really about 220 seconds. That's when the uh, device will fall back into uh, into granted state. But in general, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. All right, perfect. Next question from Matt. Uh, and I know we guys are bleeding into outside one hour slots, so I see people jumping off, but <laughs> most are staying, so that's interesting. Uh, uh, question from Matt, um, how do you find uh, out about auctions. So, uh, Mike, can you share a little bit more information about auctions uh, for next year? Well, I'll be honest with you. All I know is probably all uh, everybody else knows, and that is the FCC announced that sometime in June of 2020 it's going to going to do them. I I would I'd actually direct you to the FCC. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, question for Stefan from Stefan. Um, I'm still this preliminary trends might be able to share about typical CPI skill set and experience. Um, uh, so typical CPI sales, uh, skill set and experience. Our traditional installers that you, your traditional installers uh, are there. I mean, you already contain the proper, have the proper uh, skill set and experience. What you should remember is that each installer is going to be responsible for their own devices. And so you carry the liability for that. So you want to make sure that that uh, devices are installed properly because that's the math and assumptions that will be used to, 
to calculate uh, to, for SAS to work properly. Um, question from Curtis: How can we start preparing um, now to use GA in November, December? Uh, so in November is probably going to be a little bit earlier, but if everything goes well, com full commercialization ICDs will be over around November. Uh, so around November, December. So the suggestion is to to have a offline conversation with us. And uh, we will start working with you, with your team, to upgrade the software, prepare, uh, prepare Breeze View um, uh, to to communicate with SAS uh, and so on. So it's a good time. We will need time. Plus, you will need time to get uh, CPI certification. Uh, question from Martin: um, Are there any category A CBRS devices in the market yet? Um, I'm sure uh, there are a bunch of uh, since since uh, for category A uh, are, are operating under lower power requirements are not as uh, severe. Um, there are already some phones even that you can use that, that you can get with band 48. Um, but I can't I can't tell you any more than that, Martin. Um, Okay, one uh, question from Josh. Uh, once grandfather rules expire, you cannot uh, continue operating YMAX uh, unless it's gonna have some sort of interface with Spectrum Access System. And our software is not going to support YMAX, uh, unfortunately. Um, oh goodness! More more questions coming up. Um, how about this? Let's um, because it's just it's gonna take. Uh, it's not gonna end uh, anytime soon. We've got twenty some more questions. Uh, what I would like to do, I would like to take it offline with uh, everybody that asks questions and and basically respond individually separately uh, to each one of you uh, after the webinar. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for attending, carving out an hour and 10 minutes of your time, and uh, special thanks, Michael, for uh, you know, for your time and uh, and, uh, uh, and knowledge to share with the group. And if uh, you guys have any additional questions, comments, um, please uh, reach out to, to me, to, to Mike, if you have Mike's information. And uh, his, uh, his information uh, was in the, in the slide. It's all been recorded and will be available for offline uh, review. And that, thank you again. And I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Alex. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>